Hello, this week we're going to discuss some historical context and content from the Book of Mormon, and we're going to be in Mosiah 29 through Alma 4 today. Before we start discussing the, the storyline here, I want to show you a, a map. Uh, this map I like, I think it's helpful. Uh, I want to be careful with this for two reasons. One, this is not a map of North and South America. Please don't take this map and try to go pin it on your current uh, map that you have on your wall or someplace that just doesn't work, nor do we, that's not the intention. What it is, is it's, they've put together some locations from the Book of Mormon in relationship to each other. That's all it is. In other words, the River Sidon uh, goes from the south to the north, uh, the land of the city of Zarahemla is on the west side of it, and so forth. But it's helpful if you're if you if you like this. Uh, this is personal preference. If you like geography and following along where the army is at and so forth, this could be helpful. If it's a little hard, to, uh, difficult, small to see on the screen, you have it in your Gospel Library app. It is basically the last page of the Book of Mormon Seminary Teacher Manual, which is right there in the Gospel Library app. Or if you want to get on your computer and and find that in the church. Uh, library, you can happy to do so. It's all on there for you. So as you talk about cities and hills and, and lands, this has many of the major ones on there. I think it's helpful and a lot of fun. Now let's go straight to Mosiah chapter 29 and look right at the beginning. We notice that uh, King Mosiah, he's getting older, and he knows he's not going to be king forever, so who should be the next king? Well, it's interesting in verse 2, the people vote. They're like, you know what? We like your son Aaron. He should be the next king, which I think is interesting that they're voting of which son should be the next king. Normally, uh, kings aren't voted upon. It's the eldest son and so forth. But in this case, it doesn't matter because Aaron's not around. He and all of the other sons are on missions. Remember, they're out preaching to the Lamanites. Besides, it says they don't want to be the king anyway. So who's going to be the next leader? Well, there's an interesting discussion in here in verse 12 that I think we should go to. So Mosiah 29, verse 12. This is King Mosiah. And it should, now it is better that a man should be judged of God than of man. For the judgments of God are always just, but the judgments of man are not always just. Now Alma is listening to this, and we know he's going to be the next leader. And next week when we get to Alma 5, Alma is going to have everyone go through this personal judgment, which, and he does it in a, in a legal sense, a, a judicial manner. It's quite interesting to see how he's going to do this, but we'll get to that next week. So let's go to verse 17 and see this interesting discussion that King Mosiah has. Verse 17, for behold, how much iniquity doth one wicked king cause to be committed. Yea, what great destruction. Verse 18, yea, remember King Noah, his wickedness and abominations? Notice, he's recanting history. He's It's the whole recitation of history, so his people can remember, we have wicked kings. What about righteous kings? Well, they had King Benjamin. He was great. But there is something here that I think should be mentioned. Let's go down to a couple more verses and look at a few things. Verse 33, interesting point. And many more things did King Mosiah write unto them, unfolding unto them all the trials and troubles of a righteous king. In other words, wicked kings might tax the people and live in the lap of luxury, fly around the world on other people's expenses. But righteous kings... It's full of trials and troubles. Now, I want you to expand that a little bit so it's more than just kings, but but leaders. This, whether you're a young women's leader or a stake president, a bishop, a mom, a primary teacher. Any leader who's righteous knows that there's troubles and trials. You worry about people. You, you work diligently, long hours to be righteous and how to help people have a righteous experience in life. King Mosiah is mentioning that. 
He's older. He's tired. He saw his father fight wars and battles and then become a righteous king leader right at the end. Uh, well, he's righteous the whole time, but, but go through that great sermon at the end. So he's saying, let's not have a king. So what's the solution? Well, verse 11, let's have judges. And they're going to set up these judges in a form of checks and balances. Higher judges, lower judges, they can check and balance. What a a great uh, American system. Verse 39 tells us the reason. So let's go to verse 39. Therefore, they relinquish their desires for a king. I think that's an interesting phrase that that they desired a king. I remember in the Old Testament when the children of Israel were, were led into the promised land and they were there for a long time and they said, we want to have a king. And the reason was because all the other nations have a kings and we want to be like them. And they're like, no, you don't. And they said, yes, we do. So they got Saul as a king. And we saw that for the rest of their history, they had lots of problems with their kings. Once in a while, a righteous king would appear. But verse 38 is interesting, continuing on here, and became exceedingly anxious that every man should have an equal chance throughout all the land. So who can become a king? As we mentioned, well, the son of a king, daughter of a queen, right? Who can become a, a judge or a president or a prime minister? It's not based on who your parents are. It's based on you, your work. Love that. I just love that American sense of liberty, uh, which is 39. Therefore, it came to pass that they assembled themselves together in bodies throughout the land to cast in their voices concerning who should be their judges to judge them according to the law which had been given them. And they were exceedingly, exceedingly rejoiced because of the liberty which has been granted unto them. The fact that they had the freedom to vote was a sense of liberty, and I hope we appreciate that too, that we can vote for our leaders. Let's go to verse 42. It just says that Alma was appointed to be the first chief judge, he being also the high priest. So he's both the political and the religious leader. And then in 46, the great uh, king, Mosiah, died at the age of 63. That's 509 years after Lehi left Jerusalem. So we're about 91 B.C. So it is possible now that a baby who's born at this time would be alive at the time that the Savior was born. Probably not around when he visits the Americas, but he could be born. So we're about a generation away from the people who will be there when the Savior uh, appears in the Promised Land. Let's go to Alma chapter 1. Now, verse 1 makes it very clear. They have all these laws. But notice verse but verse 1. He had established the laws. Who's the he? Mosiah is. It's King Mosiah who made sure all the laws were established. All they had to do now was have the judges judge people based upon the law. So in verse 2 and 3, we have Nehor shows up and who wants to be the king. My question is, is how long does it take in your new system of judges before someone doesn't like it? Well, in Alma 1, verse 2 and 3, we're now less than a year because it's in the first year Nehor wants. Now, what does he want? He wants to be the king. Now, notice, in the old system, he couldn't have been. He wasn't the son of the king. But in the new system, he could be a leader. But he doesn't want to just be the judge. He wants to be the king. So they vote all kinds of tragic stories here. He kills somebody over his desire to be their leader. And verse 15, we see that capital punishment was a penalty for murder in in, uh, that system of righteous laws. Interesting point. Let's go down to verse 12. And Alma said unto him, Behold, this is the first time that priestcraft has been introduced among this people. As much as the murder was obviously a, a horrible crime, Alma's concerned about this priestcraft. Now, we've had this discussion back in 2 Nephi chapter 26, like verse 29. Read those verses. There's some great cross-referencing there. But I want you to notice that the results of this preaching here is in verse 24. Verse 24, For the hearts of many were hardened, and their names were blotted out, that they remembered no more, that they were 
excuse me, that they were remembered no more among the people of God. And also many withdrew themselves from among them. So you have some wicked people leaving the church. Verse 32 talks about their horrible things that they were doing. Well, what were the righteous doing? Look at verse 25. Now this was a great trial to those that did stand fast in the faith. Nevertheless, they were steadfast and immovable. Love that. In keeping the commandments of God, and they bore with patience the persecution which was heaped upon them. There's lots of lessons in there. Like righteous people are persecuted, but they're expected to be patient. Deliverance will come. So there's some great lessons in there. I hope you uh, can enjoy your study with those. Let's move on to, uh, let's just go to the next chapter then. Go to Alma chapter 2. We have somebody else, Amlicai in this case, who wants to be the leader now. And notice verse 2 tells us what he wants to do. <clears throat> it says by his cunning that he's their leader. And at the end of verse 2, to establish Amlicai to be a king over the people. Again, this is not even possible in the previous system. But because they can elect people, they're like, well, why don't we just vote for a king? And they do, and they uh, and the righteous people outnumber the, the wicked people. So Amlicite's army, and this is where it gets bad. It turns into the civil war. And then the Amlicite army's losing, and so they leave. But like a righteous group of people, they said, okay, let's go follow them and see where they're going to go. In verse 23, we see what happens when the spies that follow Amlicite's army returns. Verse 23, And it came to pass that on the morrow they returned into the camp of the Nephites in great haste, being greatly astonished and struck with much fear, saying, Behold, this is 24, we followed the camp of the Amlicites, and to our great astonishment, in the land of Minyan, above the land of Zarahemla, in the course of the land of Nephi, we saw a great number, numerous host of the Lamanites. And behold, the Amlicites have joined them. This is horrible. When you have a civil war and the wicked people leave and they're going to go get outside allies. Uh, could you imagine what the U.S. civil war would have been like if multiple nations sided with the South and... It would have been uh, drastic. Let's put it that way. So what do they do? Well, a lot of Nephites get killed, but they put together a great army, and they uh, they fight back, and they actually uh, end up defeating the Lamanites. So let's go to Alma chapter 3, because here's where we get to the stories. Uh, chapter 3. What do the Amlicites do? Go to verse 4. And the Amlicites were distinguished from the Nephites, for they had marked themselves with red in their foreheads after the manner of the Lamanites. Now, we don't know if that was a red blind, a dot, it doesn't say. Just they marked themselves with red on their foreheads, just like the Lamanites did. Go down to verse 13 and 14. Now, we will return again to the Amlicites, for they also had set a mark upon them, and they set the mark upon themselves, yea, even a mark of red upon their foreheads. Thus the word of the Lord of God, excuse me, thus the word of God is fulfilled. For these are the words which he said to Nephi, Behold, the Lamanites have I cursed, and I will set a mark upon them, that they and their seed may be separated from thee and thy seed forever. I want to pause here for a moment because I think there's a valuable uh, discussion that we should have with this. There's a mark. Uh, verses 6 and 19 talk about a curse. I just want to make sure it's clear that the curse is not the mark, nor is it the color of their skin or the clothing that they wore. That's not a curse. A curse is a removal of a blessing. Now, this is my opinion here. I believe the Lamanites, we know that they had families, and they were good fathers. We learned that in the story of Jacob, right? So what's the real curse? Well, these families couldn't be eternal because they didn't have the priesthood power to make the covenants to make bind these families together for time and all eternity. What's the curse? You walk away from those covenants. You walk away from those blessings. So when the Lamanites... Mark themselves, we know 
Well, who has not partaken of temple blessings? Now the Amlicites are doing the same thing. The Amlicites, this, this is an apostate group. Remember, they knew. They had the opportunity. They rejected this. But they marked themselves. Now, let's talk about this for a little bit. Because I think sometimes when people who are brought up in the church and they want to reject and rebel, they mark themselves. Now, I want to be cautious here uh, not to be judgmental. But can you not look at somebody and say they were an active member of the church, but by their dress and appearance, they're no longer making and keeping sacred covenants? Now, again, I said we have to be careful with this because I cannot sit in a sacrament meeting and judge somebody else. I just can't do it. It's not right. It's not even fair. Meaning, I don't know if somebody is joining the church. Maybe that's a mark of their past life or past traditions, and they're trying to make those changes in their life. So we can't judge somebody based upon a marking that they have or a piercing or so forth. But I think a righteous parent could look at their own child and say, okay, I can see that you're starting to mark yourselves with the marks of the world. I think it's interesting that in the Old Testament world, that tattoos and piercings was a sign of slavery. They would pierce and tattoo markings on, upon people to mark them as property. Uh, they would literally pierce parts of their face and so forth, chain them up, drag them. This is my property. I'm in control of you. It's a sign that I own you. It's interesting that uh, one of the things that's so popular in the world today is that let's take our bodies, which we know are temples of God, and mark them and tattoo them and pierce them, which is the same symbol of bondage and slavery and captivity in the old world. Uh, very interesting. I think that's a valuable discussion to have with, with family and, and, and so forth. So what happens with this great battle amongst the Lamanites and the Nephites? Uh, casualties. It says in verse 26, tens of thousands but let's scroll down to verse 27 because that's the verse that I like. And I think there's a great discussion here. Verse 27, For every man receiveth wages of him whom he listeth to obey according, and this according to the words of the spirit of prophecy. Here's a, something fun to do with, with, with kids. You ask them, say, hey, if you worked for Burger King, could you go over to McDonald's and get a paycheck? Well, they'd say, no. Can you work for... Wendy's and go over to uh, Macy's department store and get a paycheck? No, it wouldn't work. Why? You get paid by the people who you work for. So here you can make two lists. What is the work of the adversary? What is the work of the Savior? And what are their paychecks? If we're going to do the work of the adversary and then expect the Savior to give us the paycheck at the end of the world, that's ridiculous. That's as ridiculous as working at Burger King accepting a bank to pay you a paycheck as if you worked for them for the last several years. It just wouldn't work. So have that uh, discussion. That's a great conversation to have. And then let's end with Alma 4, our last chapter of this block. Alma 4, we're now in the sixth year. Is the sixth year a good year? Yes. Why? Because the people finally, because of the wars and the loss of loved ones and so forth, they humbled themselves. Let's just go to verse 3. Again, this is Alma 4, verse 3. And so great were their afflictions that every soul had cause to mourn. And they believed that it was the judgments of God sent upon them because of their wickedness and their abominations. Therefore, they were awakened to a remembrance of their duty. I like that word awakened. I think, are there things that we need to awaken ourselves to? Or do we put ourselves in some kind of a sleep and pretend like nothing's going to happen? Maybe that test is never really going to come. I'm just going to sleep my way through it and pretend it's not there. But someday you'll awaken and you realize it's test day. Maybe there's a recital. I'm not going to practice my musical instrument. Uh, that recital is never going to come. You're going to wake one day and realize it's time. Or maybe it's a debt. Oh, I can buy this boat. I'll never really have to worry about paying it off. But the, day, the debt will someday be due. We're awakened. And maybe there's some horrible natural disasters that uh, they awaken us. 
I hope we accept these natural disasters as a time to awaken, whether it's maybe a loss of a loved one. Again, tragedy sometimes awakens a family. Sometimes it's a, a disease, an illness, a loss of job, whatever it might be. Uh, I had a, I have a really good family that just loved this family. It was 9-11 that awoken them and said, we need the gospel of Jesus Christ in our lives. We baptize them and they're active and it's great. Love them. Uh, sometimes we need something to awaken us. Thus, when Alma in Alma 5, which we'll get to next time, it's all about this awakening. So what's the result of this? Verse 4, they began to establish the church more fully and many were baptized. Uh, the, fabulous. That's what we need here is a good awakening and a growth of the church. So how long is this going to last? Well, verse 6 says that in the eighth year, so we're just seven to eight years into this reign of the judges, we've already had two people want to be kings. We have uh, civil war. And what happened? The people of the church began to be proud. Why are they proud? Because of the exceeding riches and their fine silks and their fine linen. Again, this dress and appearance that makes us seem better than somebody else. In fact, the very end of verse 6, they began to wear very costly apparel. I think I'm going to go buy a cheap suit just to prove a point. Um, but notice in there, it's important uh, that Alma is going to combat this. And how does he do it? Verse 7, he consecrates te teachers and priests and elders over the church. And he realizes that the wickedness is so great. Go to verse 10. And thus ended the eighth year of the reign of the judges, and the wickedness of the church was a great stumbling block to those who did not belong to the church. And thus the church began to fail in its progress. So the church isn't progressing. It becomes stagnant. And it's because of the members. Now, I want you to think for a moment here. There's a phrase in the Book of Mormon that's used in, in several different places. In this case, it's called a stumbling block. You put a block in front of me, I can stumble over it. But that same block, if used properly, could help me stand up to a higher ground. So I think I need to evaluate in my own life, am I a stumbling block? or a stepping stone for people to come closer to the gospel? Is it possible my actions on the internet, with my neighbor, at work, with my family, is it bringing them closer to the Savior? Or is it tripping them up? They're like, I want nothing to do with that guy in that church that he's affiliated with. I think that's a powerful discussion to have. And make a list. In which ways am I a stumbling block? In which way am I a stepping stone? And then pray. Maybe there's a, a gift of the Spirit that God wants to give you to help you become more of a stepping stone rather than a stumbling block. Uh, uh, great things in there. So how does he answer? He's got to go out and go full force. He's, too, he's spread too thin, as we call it. So he is going to give up the chief judge, and he is going to give it to Nephi. That's in verse 17. And he's going to go preaching full time. So next week, we're going to do Alma's, uh, Alma chapters 5, 6, and 7. Just three chapters next week. But they're powerful chapters uh, talking about judging oneself. And then the whole atonement in there to help us become better is in there. So may God bless you and enjoy your study this week. And we'll see you next week.